thoughts and human behavior, and that was Marlon Brando. He changed all the rules. Nothing was ever going to be the same. When I first saw Brando, it was a jolting experience, this new, fresh, revolutionary being. It was an instant education. Get up, you scum-sucking pig. No, physically, he was very, very strong. He was at the gym all the time, getting those muscles gorgeous. He had great animal magnetism, very sexy. We fell in love with that beauty as a generation. He had a poet's face and a prize fighter's body. He gave voice to the silent generation and embodied the complexities of life. You have the two polarities of Brando, tremendous anger, animal-like passion. <laughs> and then on the other hand, you have Marlon, the, the whimpering child in need of support, tenderness. He is many people, depending on what he wants to be at any given moment. Many believe that by donning so many masks on screen, Brando has sometimes failed to separate Brando the man from Brando the actor. In the early days, the actors were called messengers of the gods. I think that you have to be careful which god or which level of consciousness you're going to explore. One of the most brilliant artists and eccentric personalities of our era, at times, Brando's life has seemed like a Shakespearean tragedy. I think he's a truly tragic figure as tragic as King Lear. He was going to be the father of my grandchild. It's a life that raises puzzling questions. He's killing himself. Why is he doing this? Why did he give up being an authentic person? Where is that early poetry that let him reach out? Where is it? Just as Brando's life has seen great joys as well as crushing tragedies, his career has lurched back and forth between Academy Awards and embarrassing flops. But from the beginning, his uncompromising search for personal and artistic truth has set him apart. I don't know every mile of Marlon's journey, and they have not all been smooth, but they've all been interesting. Brando's portrayal of the brutal yet vulnerable Stanley Kowalski in Tennessee Williams' play, A Streetcar Named Desire, changed acting forever. The play debuted on Broadway in 1947 and made Brando a star, able to call his own career shots by his mid-twenties. Brando was directed first on stage and then two years later on screen by Ilya Kazan. The wonderful thing about him is the ambivalence between a soft, yearning, girlish side to him and a dissatisfaction that's violent and can be dangerous. Don't you ever talk that way to me. Disgusting, vulgar, greasy. Who do you think you are, a couple of queens or something? I think the, the combination of the two, clashing, are what makes that a wonderful performance. Streetcar is the story of Blanche, an aging Southern belle who visits her sister Stella and Stella's brutish husband, Stanley. If you read that play, it's about Blanche. It's not about Stanley. And yet, you see the movie, you can't watch anyone but Marlon. I mean, really, with all due respect, He'd walk off the screen and you'd go like this, say, where's he going? I mean, he had this life and he brought this energy. He personalized every ounce of that part. How much does it cost for a string of furs like that? Why, why, these were tribute from an admirer of mine. He must have a lot of admiration. But even today, I'm awed by it. I've never seen De Niro have moments like that. I've never seen Pacino have moments like that. He, he kind of freed theatrical tradition from words. Words were not as important as behavior, as action. I mean, when you think of him as Stanley, prowling around the stage, throwing dishes, it was a new kind of, of acting. Made famous by Brando, this version of method acting taught actors to use their imaginations and their observations of the world around them in order to give more believable performances. After that, it was hard to put up with bad acting. You just had to throw all that out. You say, wait a minute, we've seen Marlon. We've been to the mountain already, you know. We can't be fooled anymore. The new star brought a range of complexity that was shocking. You see, up until that moment, movie heroes, they were unitary. Gary Cooper might have troubles along the way, but you understood who he was, and that he wasn't going to surprise you by turning crazy mean in the middle of the movie. But Brando really played those moments in, in Streetcar, and you never knew quite exactly what he was. You've got plenty of room to get by me now. 
You think I'm going to interfere with you? Stanley Kowalski's complexity came from something deep within Brando himself. Kim Hunter starred as Stella opposite Brando in both the Broadway and screen versions of Streetcar. I was having certain problems and so forth and about how I would feel about Stanley at, at, at various moments. I remember Kazan telling me, forget the name Stanley, just make your relationship with Marlon. <laughs> you can call him Stanley, but it's Marlon. To many, there didn't seem to be much difference between the on-screen character and the off-screen man. You never know where the hell he was going to sleep. You don't know whom he was with. You don't know whom he was running away from. You don't know whom he was angry about. You never knew. Every day there, there, was, a, there was a drama that he brought with him. This was true even during the theater version of Streetcar. Between his scenes, Brando used to box with a stagehand backstage. He got hit badly in the nose. And when he came up for the final scene, he was bleeding. He was coming down. Of course, he was taken off to the hospital. Actually, we all thought he really looked much better <laughs> after the nose was broken. He looked more real. The blurring of man and character haunted Brando for years after his streetcar days. People invariably associated me with the part I played so that it was difficult to believe that I didn't eat off the floor or that I, uh, you know, didn't run up the street with my, with my shoes off. And, and so it's been a hard thing sort of living that down. Years later, when Robert Duvall starred with him in the 1966 film The Chase, he was struck by Brando's seamless conversion into character. I remember he was there talking to somebody, they said action, and he... It was the same. It was the same as before and after and during the, the take. So from Brando, I learned that you minimize or totally neutralize any sense of a beginning. It's just a continuation now and before action during and cut and afterwards at times his ability on set to merge the man with the character could be disturbing to his fellow actors martin sheen starred with brando in francis ford coppola's 1979 film apocalypse now in the scene at the very end i get into the temple and you see my shadow bring the implement up i'm gonna cut his head off halfway down the dolly he turns he looks at me right in the eye and he says pray for your father and I dropped the thing, and Francis says, what's wrong? What happened? Now? Why'd we stop the shot? And I said, uh, I don't know. Brando, the actor, had improvised a line that so acutely tapped into Sheen's feelings about his own father that it accomplished what Brando's character needed. Marlon was just looking for a way to stop me from killing him. So he totally disarmed me. He looked me in the eye, and he said, pray for your father. Where's that come from? The origins of Brando's psychologically complex acting lie in a painful past that fueled his creative fire. Both the pulsing passion that Brando brought to his early film roles and his lifelong struggle against establishment convention are rooted in his painful past. Born in Omaha, Nebraska in 1924, the youngest of three siblings, Brando grew up in small-town Illinois. His father was named Marlon Brando Sr. and was a traveling salesman who traveled all, all over the country and was a great womanizer and drinker. Very rarely came home, and when he did, he would always get into terrible fights with his wife, Dodie. Dodie Brando was a skilled actress in the local theater, but also an alcoholic and an inconsistent mother. The neighbors talked about how the peanut butter jar had to be kept on a low shelf at the Brando household because Dodie was frequently not there. There were times when these kids had to go and pull her out of jail. Brando's abilities and his strong personality were evident from an early age. He was a very imaginative little boy. He was, he was a mimic from the time he was a kid. He, he was just an incredible performer always. Very rebellious, got into trouble all the time at school. Sent by his father in 1941 to military academy in Minnesota, at age 17, Brando stood out in school plays, but was expelled after a little more than a year. He never finished high school and in 1943 moved to New York to live with his sister. He signed up for acting classes at the New School for Social Research and there met a renowned actress and teacher who would change his life forever, Stella Adler. Marlon Brando managed to survive this critical late adolescent years of his thanks to Stella. What Stella did is allowed Marlon to find himself as an actor. Influenced by the old Yiddish theater of her parents, 
Adler studied with Russian theater great Konstantin Stanislavsky and then developed her own training for actors. She encouraged her students to use their imaginations to find the deeper truth in any role they were playing. From the start, Brando stood out from his classmates. Stella asked the class to imitate a chicken, which I knew that a hydrogen bomb was about to go off. And all the other kids in the class started doing crazy stuff like jumping around, flapping wings, making crazy sounds. Marlon just sat there, motionless, soundless. And Stella said, Marlon, what are you doing? He said, I'm being a chicken, sitting, waiting for a hydrogen bomb to explode, which the chicken doesn't know is a hydrogen bomb. This is the kind of originality, the freshness that Marlon would bring to a role. This early originality would be visible throughout his career. Always a master of improvisation, Brando starred in the 1976 film The Missouri Breaks, in which he plays a bloodthirsty bounty hunter who meets an ugly end. Playing opposite Jack Nicholson, a reformed cattle rustler, Brando reinvented his character daily. There's one left. I doubt it. They improvised constantly. Brando came on not thinking that the script was that good, and so he created this unbelievable character who began speaking first in, you know, in an Irish brogue, then in an English accent, then in a Western drawl. You pampered the man, and the result of this is the loss of this poor man's life! He somehow makes it work. Finding unexpected ways of making things work became a hallmark of Brando's style. And from his earliest days in New York City, he learned to use the world around him for inspiration. There was a cigar store. It was the optimum cigar store. And the actors all used it because it had a wall of telephone booths. And he said, I used to love just getting in a booth at the Optimo and just watching life go by. So he was a great observer of humanity. Throughout his career, Brando used his powers of observation. Playing opposite Martin Sheen in the 1979 film Apocalypse Now, he improvised a scene with tribal children that was ultimately cut from the final film. Marlon told the interpreter that these children should annoy him in any way that they wanted, that they should stick their fingers in his ears, in his nose, in his mouth, they should pull, tap on his head while he's going to enact this scene with me. And he's sitting down there like Buddha, and he says, August 13th, 1968. A troop of Viet Cong were trapped by a troop of... And one of these children would start messing with her. He's speaking Vietnamese to these children. It's not Vietnamese. He pulls it off like he is this great god to these children. And he's in charge of it, and they do whatever he says. That's the genius of Marlon Brando. Brando's improvisational risk-taking was first encouraged by his mentor and teacher, Stella Adler. Stella's daughter, Ellen, has known Brando since she was a teenager. I think that when Brando went to her, it was a fortunate choice because at that time, he was fragile. He was a baby, and he was a very, very tortured young man. For the young Brando, it was a long way from Illinois. They had one of the most important cultural salons in New York in the mid-40s. Uh, whether it was Aaron Copeland, whether it was Leonard Bernstein, and here we have this kid adopted by Stella, who is connected with much of the major talent in the theater world, in the music world, and the literary world of New York at the time. It was through Stella Adler's circle that Brando met Ilya Kazan and was ultimately cast in Streetcar. Adler and her group exposed the 21-year-old Brando not only to a new cultural world, but also a political one. As World War II ended, they made him aware of the persecution of millions of Jews. He probably had never met a Jewish person before. I'm sure he hadn't. And he became deeply steeped in this life. He didn't wear a talus, and he didn't grow a beard, but he became deeply, deeply aware of what these people were. Stella's brother, Luther, directed Brando in one of his first plays, A Flag is Born, which was designed to raise funds for a group of militant Jews fighting to establish the state of Israel after the Holocaust. They, in fact, did take the proceeds from this play, and they bought a boat which was used to smuggle people and arms from Cyprus to Israel. He became an honorary savior of the Jewish people. This set the pattern for years to come. He later became an honorary savior of the American Indians, the American blacks, the Black Panthers. From the Adlers, Brando gained a sense of social responsibility and a belief that his work could make a difference. 
Early on, he had a chance to shake American society in the 1953 film, The Wild One. The Wild One really established him as an icon, as a rebel, as somebody that the entire generation was looking up to. What do you want me to do, send you some flowers? It's really the epitome of the, of the pure Brando, the rebel in the motorcycle outfit with the black leather jacket. Brando plays Johnny, a bad boy biker gang leader who invades a quiet California town. There was a real kind of conflict between the generations during that time, between the young people and conservative men and women who were grown up and uh, wanted to preserve the status quo. You better send somebody for the militia. I think the film scared the hell out of a lot of people. Back then, this was terrifying. Suddenly, across America, teenagers started wearing leather as the film struck a chord with the younger generation. Everybody was troubled but inarticulate about what was troubling them. And here was this, you know, symbol of everything that we sort of thought about ourselves. The violence of the Wild One offended many, and it was even banned in England. But despite the film's impact, Brando didn't think it went far enough. Marlon, after the film came out, started making statements that the film was a failure because it really didn't address the psychological complexities and anguish of America's post-war teenagers. Though far from a teenager himself, the 30-year-old Brando knew about emotional anguish. Suffering deep depressions, his personal struggles lent a complexity to his characters. In the 1954 film On the Waterfront, released just months after The Wild One, Brando plays a conflicted young dock worker who stands up to the mob, although it means betraying his friends. Once again, he teamed with streetcar director Ilya Kazan. The thing with Brandon was interesting was I'd make these directions and about halfway through he'd say to himself, oh shit, I know that, and he'd walk away. And I'd say to myself, where's the, where's the bastard walking away to? Where's he going? But what it was was something good. He'd heard enough and it got him going. And the thing that he wanted from a director, from me, was to get him going, get the machine going. And once the machine was going, he didn't need a hell of a lot more. Come on, I better get you home. There's too many guys around here with only one thing in their mind. Am I gonna see you again? What for? I really don't want That one. This sweet, tormented, angry, messed up kid this coming to consciousness really is superbly done just as brando's character terry malloy struggled on screen off screen brando was actively seeking answers to his own unhappiness he visited his therapist regularly and had it written into his contract that he could leave the set of waterfront early every day he had a limousine provided by the studio which would whisk him across the river to his five o'clock appointment he was deeply involved in, in his analysis. I think he was trying to understand himself, understand why he suffered from such deep depressions and why he was angry so much. As early as Streetcar, Brando encouraged those around him to seek help. He damn near saved my life. I was going through a crazy period psychologically at the time during the show. Marlon noticed it. He came to my dressing room one night and started talking to me about his problems, the fact that he was going to a psychiatrist, and it really helps a lot, and I think you ought to go see someone. He was out to help, and he bloody well did. Bless his heart. In his early films, Brando was able to channel his pain into his acting with striking results. You want me my philosophy of life? Do it to him before he does it to you. There can be people who experience a lot of pain, but they don't know how to transfer it. Whatever pain he had fueled him when he needed it. I mean, either consciously or subconsciously. Marlon Brando's struggles led to success, and he won his first Academy Award in 1955 for On the Waterfront. It's a wonderful moment and a rare one, and I'm certainly indebted. Thank you. Unlike many of his peers who worked under long-term contracts with individual studios, Brando's meteoric rise to stardom largely freed him to negotiate lucrative deals on individually chosen films. But Waterfront would prove a creative pinnacle that he would not reach again for many years. His own career after On the Waterfront went into a kind of a nosedive. They stopped making Brando kind of movies right there in the mid-50s. <laughs> It was the end of the black and white movie, really. The end of these wonderful kind of small movies that said something. Cinemascope had arrived. Large-scale color spectacles that didn't say much but looked flashy. It was a desperate attempt by Hollywood to compete with television, which had stolen a half of its audience. And all those things only served to confuse 
in anger and possibly even frighten Brando. Brando tried to find a way to be a player in this new world and still do serious work. In the 1957 film Sayonara, he plays a U.S. military officer who pursues a forbidden interracial romance. And he took that picture because he thought he could say something really useful about racism. Oh, Tilly, you stupid, ignorant slob. I mean, go ahead and marry this uh, slant-eyed run if you want to. It'll serve you right. He really thought that was an important movie. And then, you know, it got out of hand. It, it got to be this big spectacle. So what would have been a good project? for him because it was in Technicolor, because it was in Cinemascope, because they kept saying, well, as long as we got all these Kabuki guys, let's show a Kabuki. But it wasn't satisfying to him. Despite the film's lack of subtlety, Brando got an Academy Award nomination for his role in Sayonara. Brando was one of the top 10 box office draws in the world, but he was feeling limited by the narrowness of Hollywood and wanted to do projects of substance. Would you say on the whole that the movie people are doing a good job? I think that that some of the producers could make an effort to, to stretch a little bit because I think people are, I, I think that they could appeal, appeal to what is a little more elevated in people instead of the common denominator. Looking for creative independence, Brando formed his own company called Pennbaker Productions after his mother's maiden name. The company was run by his father, Marlon Sr. Marlon and his dad had always fought. It was an adversarial relationship from the get-go. Senior was made president of Penny Baker Productions and now had to answer to Marlon. For the company's first production, Brando chose a Western for Paramount Pictures called One-Eyed Jacks. As director, he created a personal, at times even autobiographical film. At the center of that movie is an interesting, tormented relationship that's obviously a symbolic projection of Brando's relationship with his own father, Dad, you know, played by Carl Malden. You're One-Eyed Jack around here, Dad. I seen the other side of your face. Sure, kid. It's dad, dad, dad to that movie. Dad is flogging him and dad is beating up on him and dad is betraying him. Well, draw your own conclusions. Marlon Sr. wasn't the only authority figure Marlon Jr. struggled against. Get out, you type of guts. Wanting to craft his own film, Brando fired both the original director, Stanley Kubrick, and original writer, Sam Peckinpah. He took charge of the production. But soon, things were out of control. With Marlon, he would not, could not be hurried, could not be rushed. He would, for instance, rehearse every extra and give all the extras stuff to improvise. And there are maybe 100 extras. He spent weeks doing things like that. In the first week of shooting, the assistant cameraman tapped Marlon on the shoulder and said, you're looking through the wrong end of the rangefinder. Marlon turned around with usual chutzpah and said, well, no wonder we're going so slowly. As One-Eyed Jacks fell further behind schedule and went more over budget, Brando flaunted all controls. Paramount executive Frank Freeman, frustrated by the slow pace of production, sent Walter Seltzer to tell Brando to speed up or else. And he said, oh, the hell with it. He proceeded to go back to, to work. I said, Marlon, be reasonable. And he said, no. Finally, Freeman went in person to the set, determined to rein Brando in. And Marlon, who had eyes in the back of his head, saw us coming and he turned around a beatific smile on his face and he embraced mr freeman and freeman said marlon i've seen the last couple days rushes they're wonderful keep up the good work as freeman and i retreated i looked at uh, marlon and he did this to me <laughs> rebelling against studio constraints brando shot almost 200 miles of film and spent more than three times the original budget Eventually, Paramount took the project over and changed Brando's unhappy ending to a happy one. He was terribly hurt, not entirely understanding of the necessity of finally getting this picture ready for, for screen. Brando used to gorge on food near the end of the shooting of this movie because he was so upset about what was happening, about the studio taking over, taking control. He was very, very upset. He turned aggressively, not just to food for escape, but to women. The conquest is very important to Marlon. Everything was a game, you know, a sexual game. He was uh, super sexed. He was constantly on the prowl. He was very uh, attractive, and he had a great style for seduction. He could manipulate feelings like uh, nobody else. Marlon's been married legally only twice, but he has children by many women. 
I believe I came up with 15 children, some of whom have never been acknowledged. In 1954, Brando's first brush with marriage came when he was engaged to French woman Josanne Berenger. She was the babysitter for Marlon psychoanalysts. He thought that she was the answer to the demands of stardom, and he would go off and marry this fisherman's daughter from the south of France. The engagement was broken off suddenly, and in 1957, he married actress Anna Kashfi. They quickly divorced and began a more than decade-long custody battle over their son, Christian. In 1960, Brando married actress Movita Castaneda, with whom he had two children. And then, soon after, on the set of MGM's Mutiny on the Bounty in Tahiti, he met co-star Tarita Terapaya, who later bore his son, Tehotu, and daughter, Cheyenne. Fletcher Christian is, is my name. Is my name. Brando was still one of the most powerful stars in the world, and on the set of Mutiny, he and the production spiraled out of control. Every night was a party that went on and on and on and it was a constant stream of women. And that took precedence over the movie. The studio was almost bankrupted by the, the cost overruns on this single film. MGM's mutiny suffered from a variety of problems. In addition to Brando's excesses, there were monsoons, constant script revisions, and three different directors. Brando was made to take the fall for that production. The decade after that picture, Brando was just scrambling to make a living. You remarkable pig. You can thank whatever big god you pray to, you haven't quite turned me into a murderer. Frustrated by his battles with Hollywood, the 42-year-old Brando purchased a string of islands off the coast of Tahiti. He moved to the South Pacific and became openly cynical about movie making. He would get into these raps with the press where he'd say, oh, movies are just product and I'm just a hack, I'm just a guy making a living. It is a business, it's no more than that. And, uh... Uh, those who pretend that it's an art, I think, are misguided and uh, uh, acting as a craft and it's a profession not unlike being an electrician, plumbing, or an economist. The way of getting on and providing food and shelter for yourself and family. Throughout the 60s, Brando alienated people in Hollywood with his disinterested attitude. During this period, Robert Duvall worked with him on The Chase. I can remember we got together and we talked. I said to my wife, oh, this is going to be great. We're going to be like brothers. Then he never spoke to me for eight weeks. I said to me, I said right then, this guy is worse than a woman. He won't even say hello to you. He, he knows you want him to say hello to you, so he doesn't do it. So what's that proving? Kind of put me off, but yeah, that's the way he is. With his attention focused in the South Pacific, Brando became a marked man in Hollywood, and in the 60s, his career fell to new lows, including a string of 10 failures in a row. His role in the 1968 film Candy was particularly striking. It was a goof. I mean, this was a bizarre thing. You had Ringo Starr, Sugar Ray Robinson. It was an incredible cast of characters. It wasn't a movie, it was a party. He plays a guru, an Indian guru. So you must find that place right off which we call the center of all breath. My love? Oh, well, no, it is not that simple. It's a terrible movie. It's just not good. Perhaps it is here. <gasps> I think it is. So soon, we found it so soon. While many thought Brando had lost his center as an actor, his focus had shifted. Since his early films, Brando had challenged the established order. But by the 1960s, he was taking positions that were outright radical. Marlon has been one of my inspirations for social justice. He was known for it. It's risky, and it cost him. Brando has always been willing to fight for his beliefs. Even in the face of opposition, he has long demonstrated a generous heart. Send your contribution to help Hungary and I think that comes out of this essentially compassionate nature, which is traceable into his childhood. There are all these stories, seeing a woman faint on the street and bringing her home, and caring for her until she was better. I think it really comes out of something that's really true to him and, and his compassionate, suffering nature. Continuing his commitment to the underdog that began with Jewish causes during his Stella Adler days, Brando became involved in the civil rights struggle early on. It's on the move. Civil rights is a wave that's going to sweep the country. After the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., Brando went where others wouldn't. One of my dearest friends, a black man, John Crane, called me and he said, Martin, stay in doors this night. 
There was a lot of tension about snipers. I turned on the television, and Marlon Brando was walking through Harlem with Mayor Lindsay. Now that's pretty gutsy stuff. Marlon does identify with people who are hurt, people who are maimed, people who are deprived. That's real. It's there. Brando became a staunch supporter of Native American rights, and throughout the 70s, nearly all of his public appearances involved Indian activism. We Americans have a solemn obligation to follow our treaty obligations. I hope you would receive my sentiments and my apologies. Human rights simply do not exist for the American Indian. Brando was an activist, not a passive supporter. He joined a group of American Indians in their armed struggle in Wisconsin in 1975. They occupied land they felt had been illegally seized from the local tribe. Eventually, the National Guard moved in, and the tense standoff escalated. They asked me, what about Mr. Brando? And they looked at Brando, and, and he said, you don't have to ask me. He said, I'll stay. All of a sudden, the shooting began, and we all hit the floor. Brando down there, he was shaking his head. He says, I didn't know these guys would go this far, but I know now the struggle these people are prisoners of war, and I think that they should be accorded the same accords that we treat other prisoners of war. Risky. Real risky. If you're going to get involved in social justice in a public venue, it's costly. It's going to cost you something. Brando's radical politics cost him favor in Hollywood, but so did his difficult reputation and spotty track record. By the early 1970s, he was a pariah. He was nowhere. I mean, he had made 10 flops in a row, he had no money. But Brando was wanted by a young director, Francis Ford Coppola, who was beginning work on his new film, The Godfather. Incredibly, Paramount insisted on a screen test. To do a screen test of Marlon Brando? I mean, Three Car Named Desire on the waterfront, it's crazy, it's humiliating. But Marlon was desperate to get back up on the marquee. Coppola went to Brando's house with a video camera and watched the 46-year-old Brando stick cotton balls in his cheeks and magically transform himself into 67-year-old godfather Don Corleone. And they took the test back to the guys at Paramount and they looked at it and they said, who is this? They didn't know it was Brando. And they gave me the okay. Even after this unusual step, the studio was taking no chances. But Brando's deal was very complicated. If he screwed up, he would not be paid any money, and he would be responsible for all monies laid out by the studio. I mean, it was a bizarre arrangement. They were basically putting a gun to his head and saying, you're not going to do uh, a mutiny on the bounty with us. You're not going to do another one-eyed jacks on us. You're going to be a good boy. Brando was on his best behavior, and once shooting began, his fellow actors were full of respect. It was an easy process to kind of relate to him as the godfather, because there was a parallel in life that was very obvious and very specific. Aware of Brando's difficult reputation, Robert Duvall looked for ways to lighten the mood on the set. There was a scene out there in that uh, compound where they had the wedding. Well, he grabbed his pants and I grabbed mine. We mooned to like a hundred extras, and Coppola tried to stop it. And I don't know if you can put this on TV. Some woman said, you look great, Mr. Duvall. But she said to her fan, but did you catch the balls on that Brando? She said, like, we laughed so hard. <laughs> the zany antics fit alongside Brando's unconventional process. He would use cue cards, sometimes even plastered to extras' foreheads, claiming that it kept him spontaneous and in the moment. He emphasizes, either consciously or unconsciously, a, a certain irreverent process to his work. That's why he can look up and take his line off a tree. They had a billboard up there with these lines painted. You know, he can go, like, oh, you know, he can go up and take it, you know. What he did is exactly what we're doing now. You talk, I listen. I listen, you talk. And from that, if you're, if you're relaxed and open and talented, then you're going to fill up and be vulnerable. You're going to have anger. Whatever it's going to take, the scene takes. If you come to me in friendship, then the scum that ruined your daughter would be suffering this very day. And if by chance an honest man like yourself should make enemies, then he would become my enemies. And then they would fear you. Be my friend. Godfather.
The Godfather was an artistic and commercial hit, grossing over $100 million in its first year and winning Brando the Academy Award. His career was revitalized, but as always, Brando created controversy. On the evening of the Academy Awards ceremony, Native American activists were one month into their armed showdown with the United States government at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. Firing was going on, and here we were watching the Academy Awards. And then they said, the winner is Marlon Brando for Godfather. Here comes this Indian girl, Sashi and Littlefeather. And she said she wants to make a statement. And it's Brando declining to accept the Oscar because of the treatment of American Indians at Wounded Knee. I came here tonight as an official representative for Marlon Brando. And what Marlon Brando has in his heart is that the image of Native Americans in this country of the United States should be changed. Wow, the whole place just exploded in there. Just guys were out there firing their rifles out. Many in Hollywood were troubled by the way that Brando brought his politics to the Oscars. That was a stupid thing to do. Either don't come at all or turn up and say thank you very much and get off the stage. It's kind of a, his choice, a kind of a self-indulgent thing, you know. If you get an Oscar, go get it. Brando's controversial and unpredictable actions off screen were mirrored by an increasingly irregular working style on set. After starring in Bernardo Bertolucci's X-rated 1972 film Last Tango in Paris and improvising his way through the Missouri breaks, Brando would get a chance to find something deep within himself when he reteamed with Francis Ford Coppola in the 1979 film about the Vietnam War, Apocalypse Now. Brando played the part of Kurtz, a top-notch U.S. Army officer who, when confronted by the depravity of war, goes insane and creates his own colony of death deep in the jungles of Vietnam. That was a whole journey, a bizarre set of events. He arrived extremely overweight, much more so than our agreement with him. And after a few days, uh, what I finally did is by dressing him in black and photographing only his face, deal with the weight by by uh, that illusion. We used to do Brando imitations. And I remember the final dress rehearsal, he watched me to see how I was going to do it. And I said, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. And it smells like, and I went, victory, like Brando. And he laughed, oh, how could you do that? Brando was hired for five weeks for more than $1 million. He often disagreed with Coppola's vision for the film and was not happy with the ending. He was trying to tell Francis that he wasn't comfortable with this scene and the way it was written uh, was not pleasing to him. And, and as, he was, <laughs> as he was speaking, he was folding the script. And by the time he got finished explaining why he wasn't comfortable with this scene, he had made a hat out of the pages, and he, and he put it on his head to keep the sun off. Without a scripted end, Coppola let Brando and Sheen improvise. You could see a process in him as he worked. It was very exciting in a, in a lot of ways, and it was very unpredictable, you know, and, and he didn't always know where he was going, and that's what made it a very uh, exciting journey to go with him. Are you an assassin? I'm a soldier. You're an errand boy, sent by grocery clerks to collect the bill. Brando's unconventional techniques on Apocalypse helped make it a success, but there have been few signs of his genius since. In the 1980s, he tried to stay out of the public eye, but tragedy would be just around the corner. Brando began the 90s with a comic turn in The Freshman, in which he parodied his role as the Godfather. Though the film was a charming success, by this time, Brando seemed to have little interest in acting or in the public's perception of him. His behavior is really quite remarkable. The only thing I know that is comparable to it is Orson Welles. They eat their way out of their beauty and their attractiveness, and, and they say, really, can you love me? Can you love me grossed out this way? I asked him why Orson Welles had allowed himself to get so heavy, and his answer was he stopped caring. So if he stopped caring, then maybe Marlon just stopped caring. For Brando, 
acting had long been overshadowed by more important things. In May 1990, while Brando was at home in Los Angeles, there was a gunshot. In another room, his son Christian had shot and killed Dag Drolet, the boyfriend of Brando's pregnant Tahitian daughter, Cheyenne. Christian was drunk at the time and believed that Drolet had been physically abusing his half-sister. Christian pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter, and at the sentencing hearing, Brando told the court what he'd seen. I felt his pulse on his neck. He still had a pulse. And I breathed into his mouth, and I called 911. He took a lot of responsibility for that, especially when he was pleading for his son. But he's, I think, probably a disaster as a father. As much as it may not be believed by Dag and Lizette, I love Dag. He was going to be the father of my grandchild. In 1995, four years after Christian was sentenced to 10 years in prison, life turned even more tragic. Cheyenne, who had never recovered from Drolet's death, took her own life. The deaths of those two people were catastrophic to him and also, uh, I think, made him withdraw more from the world, become more of a recluse. We had a relationship that, that endured off and on 30 years. And when everything went down with Christian, he seemed to want to change his his uh, address book, you know, just empty it out. I got him on the phone. I said, you were my hero coming up, you know. You know, it'd be nice to see you again sometime. You know, we're all getting older. But he was unavailable. Brando has acted in films since the tragedies, including Don Juan de Marco and The Island of Dr. Moreau. But despite occasional glimpses of brilliance, his performances fall far short of the standard that he set for greatness. He's not acting anymore. He's not acting, he's showing up. <laughs> he's showing up and he's getting the check. I wish for all of us that he would have retired 15 years ago. Marlon lost his faith in Hollywood. He just became disgusted with it all and tried to outdo them at their own shenanigans and began to look into the abyss and become part of it. Unfortunately, people in my position uh, People in the public eye are sellable commodities, but they're not any different than Kleenex or Dial Soap or anything else. He was a victim or a prisoner of what he supposedly hated, but yet supposedly what fed him and he fed it, I don't know. I think you can make peace with that in a better way maybe than he did. Yet, in spite of his struggles, Brando's legacy of greatness endures. He's virtually redefined screen acting and he's given us back a part of ourselves which i don't think any actor has been able to do he's had so many things happen to him so many terrible wonderful things i think he's still searching for truth he's still searching for an answer we have an opportunity to kind of see him grow on film it's remarkable to see that journey every character is some reflection of his thought, his mind, his past, his heart, his spirit. And I think that is the great gift we have of him. Al Pacino, another brilliant, brilliant actor who adored Marty, almost fainted when he worked with him. I mean, he just was in such awe of him. Francis tells a story about him that Al, the first scene he did with him was a hospital scene. And, Al could not go in the room when they were ready to shoot the scene. And Francis said, what's the matter? Are you giving action? You're not moving. Said, you don't realize that's Marlon Brando in there. He's, I'm playing his son. I, I can't just walk in there. That's Marlon Brando. Don't you know who's in there?